Thank you so much. Um, I was so thrilled when we could make this talk happen and it gets me out of very cold Washington, D.C. Can everybody hear me okay in the back, by the way? Yeah, okay. Uh, so when I drove to the airport this morning, it was 29 degrees and I refused to wear my coat because I knew I was coming to where it was 67 degrees. So happy to be here, even if it's short. Uh, what I wanna try to do in very short order, and I'm gonna be honest about my um, time so that I can leave a lot of time for questions and answers and um, comments that you might have. Uh, but what I wanna try to do in this time is present uh, a way of thinking about terrorism that might be a new way for you to think about something that is very difficult to think about. And I wanna give you a little background um, about how I even got into this in the first place. I can tell you as a young PhD student starting at George Mason University, I never thought I would study terrorism, let alone that it would be the topic of my dissertation, which is you know a lot of years and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. So it's a big investment when you decide on your topic. But events happened in the world that kind of guided me there. So I wanna just give you a little background um, on that, when I started graduate school at George Mason University, it was uh, the year 2000, and I was living in Northern Virginia with my family, who my parents were still there, and uh, when the September 11th attacks occurred, I had a morning class on the Fairfax campus, and this was back in the days, this makes me sound old, but this was back in the days when we had phones, but they weren't smart, so you know, you, you used an alarm clock to, to wake you in the morning and then you got up and you got ready. And I did those things and I didn't turn the TV on, I didn't turn the radio on, so I just got in my car to go to my 9.30 public choice class and I turned the radio on in my car, which also makes me sound old, right? Because we don't even do that anymore. We don't listen to the radio. We have Pandora streaming through our high-tech vehicles. And uh, I heard instantly what was happening. My parents actually didn't live that far at the time from the Pentagon. So I did, I think, what probably a lot of people who would have been in this situation did, which is turn around. I went back home and I watched TV all day long. And I think I had the same thoughts that day that many Americans had, which is what has happened to us? And the fear of what was coming. Was this the beginning of a series of attacks? Who is Al-Qaeda? I mean, people at the Central Intelligence Agency at that time knew and were following Al-Qaeda, but ordinary Americans, it, you know, it wasn't kind of the dinner table talk, like it might be now, but it certainly was post 9-11. So at the time, I was a, a research assistant to uh, one of my professors. He was the editor of a journal, and he said, I'm gonna dedicate a special edition of this journal to the topic of terrorism. And here's why I'm gonna do that. Because economists need to be in front of this issue. We need to have a loud voice about something that economists are not gonna be invited to the table to talk about. Policymakers are gonna talk about it. Bureaucrats are gonna talk about it. Presidents are gonna talk about it. All sorts of people are gonna talk about it but they're not gonna invite economists to talk about it. And economists actually have something to say. So I wrote this paper with him, and of course I got hooked, um, if you can say that about such a thing, right? I got hooked uh, because I thought, I think the framework, the economic, the very fundamentals of the economic way of thinking allow us to open our framework, open our scope of analysis, and I think really get to the questions that we're all after, which is can we live in a post-terrorist world? Is that possible? Is it a reality? And how, how do we think about that in the way that economists think about everything else, which is incentives and costs and benefits? So that's really what I'm doing here. So for those of you who have taken economics, who are economists, um, there's nothing that I'm going to say in, in terms of economic theory that's rocket science. But I think that's really the beauty and the power of economics is that it lays out some very fundamental principles that we can apply to lots of things. Again, that we don't think economists necessarily have something to say about. So here's where I'm going to start. This comes out of a long discipline of what we might call market process economics or Austrian economics, which is called the human action model. Why this is important, and I think all good economics always should start with human anthropology. Why? Because that's what we're studying. We're studying how human beings make decisions under conditions of scarcity. That's what we do, right? That's what we think about. So I wanted to, to take that narrative and apply it to terrorists. And I didn't think anybody else was doing that. So here's how it goes. 
The model of human action, this is not mine, this is the theory that's been developed over a long period of time, is that for human beings to engage in a purposeful choice, a decision, to make a decision and act upon it, three things have to be present. The first is we experience a state of uneasiness. We're unhappy with the current state of affairs, right? And number two is we have a vision for a different outcome. And number three, we take conscious and purposeful steps to get there. Again, none of this is rocket science. You're thinking, okay, I get it, right? So the, the very simple example is you wake up in the morning and your stomach is growling because you've been fasting asleep for a long time, hopefully. And you say, I don't like this. I don't like being hungry, right? And so what do you do about it? Well, you understand that there's things that you can do, there's actions that you can take that are pretty simple, and you can alleviate that. You can alleviate that uneasiness for a time, right? So these are, th th these are the conditions necessary for human beings to jump into this type of behavior. And that was the framework. This is the narrative that I'm using to study members of Al-Qaeda. And that's really where I'm going to focus my talk tonight. That was the focus of my own uh, dissertation work and my ongoing work. So we could talk about a lot of how this applies to a lot of different terrorist groups. Uh, but that's kind of where my historical research has been. But this point is important. Ta what, is, what am I saying? Terrorists are conscious. They are purposeful. They make plans. And they want their plans to succeed in the same way that you and I want our plans to succeed. It's a very different narrative than terrorists are crazy, right? So if we assume these things, I think it's actually the most optimistic way to start the analysis. Because it assumes, or at least it, it, it puts forth the possibility that there might be a world where the terrorists who engage in this type of rationale might say, this is not the best use of my time. And that's what we need. If we want less terrorism in the world, we have to change the incentives that the terrorists face. That's, it's that simple and also that difficult. And I'm going to get into the difference between the leaders of a terrorist group and the recruits. They have different um, ways of calculating benefits and costs, right? But we want the ordinary terrorist to wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to do this. The cost is too high. The risk is too great. I'd rather do something else, make another investment of my time. And we want to presume, and I think economics allows us to presume, that that's possible. It's possible for human beings to change that calculus if they view that their conditions have changed. So another thing I did, which is very basic in terms of the economics that I'm using here, is that I said, OK, we need to talk about terrorism on you know, kind of using supply and demand analysis. In some ways, it's a little bit more complicated than when you go to Starbucks and you buy a latte, right? That's easy to understand. You go, you go through your drive-thru, right? You give them your credit card, you get a latte. The latte is $5. If you voluntarily engaged in that choice, all we know is that you'd rather have the latte than the $5, right? And that's it. And what we know here is that if you're somebody who's supplying the lattes, then you like when the price goes up, you're willing to supply more of them, right? And if you're the consumer, if you're the demander of the lattes, what do we know about you? That all else equal, as the price of those lattes go down, you're going to consume more. Very basic economics here. But nobody at the time, and I think not enough people now, are using this analytical framework to understand the behavior of Al-Qaeda or ISIS or the Taliban or anybody else. And I'm not sure why we wouldn't do that. So that's the question. That's where I started my research. What does all that mean? It's pretty complicated, right? It begs questions. Who are the suppliers of terrorism? How do I separate them from the demanders of terrorism? And terrorism is not a latte, right? And I don't mean that in a trite way. So when I go into a private business like Starbucks and I buy a coffee, it's discreet. Right? It's me and Starbucks making a decision. It's a private decision. But terrorism has some kind of public goods types of qualities to it. And actually what they're creating for most people is a bad. It's a negative thing. Right? So I wanted to kind of get into that and think about what it meant. So where, where am I going to start? I'm going to start kind of with some of the theory and then get into uh, my case study of Al-Qaeda here. But the most important part to me was that terrorism is context dependent. Which means what? I think the way economists should and can 
study terrorism is to take these basic principles and then go do deep analytical narrative type studies to understand, well, if I use this framework, what does it tell me about Al Qaeda? about their inception, about the way they run their organization, about their goals, because that's going to tell me about the demand for Al Qaeda. And the only way, let me go back real quick, the only way, this is the bottom line right up front, okay? In economics, what we would say is if you want people to stop doing things that you don't like them to do, smoking, drinking too much, driving too fast, whatever it is, you actually have to affect their demand curve for those things. Affecting the supply curve is not enough. So kind of my, the policy implications of my research, which I'll get to come back to later, are that a lot of our kind of post 9-11 war on terror policies have been directed at the supply curve. Meaning, what do we have to do right after a thing like 9-11? And I'm not criticizing this. I think it's necessary and reasonable. You shore up the airport defenses, right? You make it harder for people to hijack airplanes. Why? That's a reasonable thing because people hijacked airplanes. We don't know if they're going to do it again. It seems like a vulnerable point, right? So it's reasonable to say, let's raise the cost of doing it that way. But here's the problem. That doesn't alter the demand curve of the person that's a committed member of Al Qaeda. Because you know what they're going to do? They're going to find another way. It's not going to be airports. It's going to be something else. So the thing is, it's necessary to defend ourselves, but it's not sufficient. If we want a world with less terrorism, we got to focus on the demand curve as well as the supply curve. It's a very hard thing to do, but I think it's fully possible. So we'll talk about that. So terror, to do that, though, we have to understand why are people motivated to engage in these types and participate in these types of activities. And to understand that, I think we have to say, OK, terrorism is context dependent. It's a time and place kind of thing. So when I was looking at Al-Qaeda, I was wondering, why bin Laden? Why Saudi Arabia? Why the late 80s? What was unique? What was special? What motivated him? What enabled him to recruit people who were very committed to a mission that was extremely costly to them and their families, right? So what is the motivation? So we can look at what was going on with bin Laden, with the politics. But I think that's the story over time. And so here's kind of. There's a lot of graphics that I could show. I think this is a big one that tells you the context is changing if we look at the overall global war on terror. Here's the good news. Since 2014, 2014 was the historic all-time high for terrorist incidents worldwide. And you can see the peak in the graph here, right? But look at terrorism prior to 9-11. It's at very low historical levels, right? So what we want to say is what's going on, U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, Iraq, the Syrian civil war, the context in these different places are changing, right? And that's going to create different incentives for terrorists to use terrorism as a mechanism to get the changes that they want or that they say they want, okay? So we need to understand that terrorists operate in a very purposeful way. They're assessing their environment. They're assessing the needs of the organization. And they are mobile to some extent, especially modern day terrorist groups. They bop around. So Al Qaeda does this, and I'm going to uh, talk about that in a little bit. The first thing that I thought was very difficult and kind of daunting when I was doing my research is to say, how am I defining terrorism? This is actually quite important. Uh, there's a lot of political implications for too broadly defining what terrorism is, right? Because the famous saying is, you know, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, right? So if our definition of terrorism is too broad, then we can kind of lump in any activity that we don't like as terror, call it terrorism, and then launch a lot of resources at it. So you have to be cautious. I wanted to be very clear about what that definition is. So I relied largely on the State Department definition so what they say are a couple things here that I think are important, and I add a little bit of uh, layers of complexity on that. There's not one cause of terrorism. If you look at the political science journals, people had been thinking about and researching and talking about terrorism prior to 9-11. So this is, I'm not, you know, I'm not the only game in town who was doing this. Uh, I don't think that there were a lot of people doing it in kind of the way I was doing, which is applying the economic thinking to it. There's a lot more people doing that now. But there's not one cause. So you can imagine right after 9-11, lots of academics rushed to this and said, OK, I want to understand this. 
Is it poverty that causes terrorism? Is it being born in a certain country? Are you more likely to be a terrorist if you're born in X? Is it lack of education? You didn't go to school. Are you a member of the wrong religion? What is it? And it turns out it's not that simple. Nothing is, right? There's not one cause. Poverty is not an explanatory variable here that has any meaning. Um, it's not lack of education. It's not people strictly from you know, certain countries with certain religions. So those don't, you know, they get us maybe on the path, but they don't fully explain. So there's not one cause. But terrorism is a response by people who are looking at the incentives of the environment that they live and they want to change the institutions. They are unhappy. They live in a dysfunctional set of institutions. The places in the world today that are the hottest breeding grounds for terrorism are the places that lack economic freedom, political freedom, civil freedoms, religious freedoms. So there's a story we can tell there, but we still have to dig deep and look at what's going on in each case study. Terrorism can be executed or actualized by a person, by one person. We tend to call this the lone wolf theory, right? You have one person, uh, they don't have necessarily, they could have a lot of resources, and they execute um, an attack. Like they strap, you know, bombs to themselves, suicide bombers, and they go on the subway. That's a way to execute terrorism. But terrorism can also be group behavior. So what I was looking at, Al-Qaeda, we were looking at a group. And important, this is very important, terrorism, terrorists, excuse me, attack non-combatants, right? They attack civilians. They attack people who um, symbolize something that they don't like, right? And what's the reason for that? The reason is to instill panic and fear. That's the goal. That's the objective. If they don't make us afraid, they're not very successful terrorist groups. Right? From our perspective, from a policy perspective, we actually want terrorist groups to be unsuccessful. Right? So how do we think about that? And then how do we change the incentives? So th those are some of the things that I was looking at in the definition. So I want to kind of go into looking at Al-Qaeda. This is just some highlights from, from what I've been studying and then you know, uh, kind of finish it up with some suggestions maybe on where we can go. This is, this is kind of a long historical story, by the way. Uh, and this is not a criticism of any of the presidents that I'm talking about. This is just a kind of a timeline of events in terms of the U.S. involvement in the Persian Gulf as it pertains to U.S. national interests, in particular as it relates to our desire to have access, control, some geopolitical interest in oil. Okay? So the Carter Doctrine is announced in Jimmy Carter's State of the Union Address. You know, all presidents kind of have doctrines, right? This goes back to Truman. So the Carter Doctrine is announced and it says uh, there's going to be no outside forces in the Persian Gulf. And the U.S. is going to use military force, if necessary, to defend those interests. Right? So it's a positioning event when he says this. It's saying we're going to put boots on the ground if we have to because this is a vulnerable area. Right? What is this following? The Iran hostages that happens in 1979 and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that happens in 1979. So the Carter Doctrine is really followed on by the Reagan Doctrine, okay? The Reagan Doctrine not only um, restates some of these same interests, but financially is involved and, you know, kind of boots on the ground is involved in funding uh, the defenses against the Soviet um, or the Soviet resistant forces. So for the Reagan administration, now we start to put our money where our mouth is in a very clear way. Twenty billion is spent we're providing military equipment, 40 F-16 Stinger missiles, credit for military purchases. Okay, so this is a strategic um, mil uh, political and military assistance package to defend that region against Soviet domination. So there's a lot of things that are going on in the world where Al-Qaeda fits nicely into the story, right? So there's a story to tell here. It's the context. The context always matters. So let's talk a little bit about how Al Qaeda comes to be. And I, you know, I, uh, it was mentioned in my introduction. I didn't really say this part, but after I finished my PhD, my professor said, "You have to go work at the CIA." And I said, "Why would I do that? I want to be a professor." Um, and he said, "Because you've been thinking about this. You know, you've been kind of doing the theoretical and intellectual work. Let's just go do it." Uh, so I did. And I was an economic analyst working at the CIA. And what we were doing is what a lot of you know, ongoing work, 
uh, that, that has happened before me and still goes on there, which is tracking the assets, the resources, the transfer of resources among suspicious terrorists. It's a very hard thing to do. Um, that's why they call it, ironically, intelligence. It's actually a lack of, right? You want to gain the intelligence, but most often you don't have it. So it's very difficult to do. But you can see here, with even back to the Reagan doctrine, it's hard to know where the resources originally came from, who they were transferred to later. So it's a complex story. So Al Qaeda fits nicely into this. The Soviet invad invasion of Afghanistan runs from 1979 to 1989. At that time, the CIA engages in a program called Operation Cyclone. Operation Cyclone channeled funds through the Pakistan, Pakistan's intelligence agency, which is called the ISI, and it trained Mujahideen to fight the Soviets. Over 100,000 were trained. Okay, it started out at 20 to 30 million dollars a year, and at the end it was about 630 million dollars a year. So lots of resources, lots of training, tactical training, and financial resources to what? Fight the enemy. And uh, Bin Laden fits into this time frame. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. He was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood before that, so he had been trained. Um, he had been recruited by spiritual leaders. And he also had a very kind of anti-Western U.S. mentality. So this kind of stuff, well, you know, it was it, your enemy's enemy is your friend, right? So he's going to capitalize on the assistance, and then later he's going to take a different side, okay? This is a picture of Ronald Reagan um, in the early 80s meeting with the uh, Pakistan, members of the Pakistan's ISI agency, which is their version of the CIA. Uh, and so there's kind of, again, this story is unfolding. Al-Qaeda officially is founded in 1988. Okay, so it's well after, it's almost at the end of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And it's founded by three people. You know this person here, right, on the right, Osama bin Laden, Abdullah Yusuf Azam, and Ayman al-Zawahiri. Zawahiri is the current leader of Al-Qaeda. Azam is dead. Bin Laden is dead. Azam was the spiritual mentor who had been training and investing intellectually in Bin Laden to do this. So he didn't do it alone. But Bin Laden's an important figure in this story because he's the son of a billionaire. He was a university student when he decided to organize Al Qaeda. So I want you to think about, remember, we'll go back to the human action model. This is somebody who's wealthy. This is somebody who's smart. This is somebody who has political connections. This is somebody who's well known. Their family is well known in the community. When I think about that myself, I think, which way would I go? Would I start this rogue organization? And when, think about, at the end of his life, how he's living. He's living in a compound without access to the internet, receiving mail and packages right, by messenger, because he can't have any possibility of being detected, right? So there's no Wi-Fi use, there's no, in it. to me that's worse than prison, right? For most of us, that's worse than prison. It's a very expensive choice, and when I think about him as related to any one of us, you or me, I'm not a powerful person, I'm not a wealthy person, I certainly have no political connections that are useful anyway, right? But he goes against that, and he says, I'm gonna start this organization, I'm going to use my personal fortune to jumpstart it, and I'm going to recruit people, and I'm going to mentor them, and I'm going to take care of them, and I'm going to get them to give their lives for what I care about. That's an interesting story that I think we need to talk about, understand. Uh, and when you think about what Al-Qaeda was able to accomplish with very few people and very little money, by the way, it's phenomenal. Not in a good way. So that's the other thing we have to be cautious of here. Terrorism is not about having a lot of resources or having a lot of people. It's having people who are committed and who are very carefully weighing costs and benefits so that they can be successful, right? And so what we want is for ordinary people, again, to, to not make that decision because it's costly, it's morally repugnant. There's a lot of reasons, right, to want to turn that around. The how you do that is the complicated part. This is a picture of bin Laden with a Pakistani journalist. The reason the picture is interesting is because there's a gun that's hanging on the wall. The gun is a Russian gun that was captured 
uh, by some of the Soviets during the uh, Afghanistan invasion. So he's giving an interview and he's proudly disp displaying this gun saying, you know, we beat the Russians. So he starts Al Qaeda in 1988. He issues an 8,000 word personal statement. He's very known for doing this. In that personal statement, you get a little bit of an idea, perhaps, of what his goals were and what he was trying to do, but it's a lot, it's a lot of ranting, too. So it's very hard to decipher for an analyst. And so, by the way, there's people at the CIA who just work on that. They just work on looking at the words and the language and the speeches of people to try to figure out what they actually mean. And it's complicated because part of the speech is to raise money and to get recruits. And so you have to be very fanatical. You have to be very extreme, right? But the other part of his speech is to take a, send a message to the West. This is who we are. This is where, what we're about. And you better take us seriously. So it's very long. So <coughs> from there, I wanted to say, okay, what, is the, what was the life cycle of Al-Qaeda like? Because Al-Qaeda today is a very different organization than it was in 1988. And by the way, people who are you know, former analysts at the CIA will tell you, in the early 80s and the mid 80s, bin Laden was on the radar of analysts at the Central Intelligence Agency, but you know, kind of just on the radar. They weren't sure what was going on. It didn't take very long to go from the mid 80s to the late 80s to him starting the organization in 2001, one of the most devastating modern terrorist attacks. It's very deadly. So, you know, the CIA was behind the game trying to figure this out. So it's very hard to be ahead of the game, whether we're talking about Al Qaeda or ISIS or whoever we're talking about. So I wanted to use economic theory and some theories from political science to help me try to understand this. There's, there's something um, that we talk about in economics and in political science called the roving bandit theory. And the roving bandit is, just think about what that means. It's a person who plunders, right? That's what a bandit is, right? But they rove around. Uh, so think about the burglars, the thieves, um, who are hunting around trying to figure out what houses to break in or what neighborhoods to break, you know, are, are ripe targets for breaking into a house in the middle of the night. Uh, they're not setting up shop in one place. They're going around. They're very opportunistic. They don't plant seeds, right? They don't make ties in the community. They're roving bandits. What's the benefit of being a roving bandit? Well, you can act very extreme and then you can leave. You're mobile. Right? So maybe it's you're more elusive from the people who are trying to attack you or capture you. Uh, and then there's stationary bandits. Now, stationary bandits, they both have benefits and costs, but the stationary bandit, what do they have to do? So it's less costly from an organizational perspective to plant your seeds, to stay in one spot, right? Because then you're not moving around all the time. That's expensive, right? It requires a lot of mobility. But what does the stationary bandit have to do? It has to integrate itself into the community in a way that the roving bandit does not, right? Because they have to make ties with the community. They need members of the community to be in alliance with them. Maybe one might say somewhat allegiance, right? So they have to have investments in that community. So there's different costs and benefits to this. At the beginning of their life cycle, Al-Qaeda was a roving bandit. So here's kind of what happened. They start out in Saudi Arabia. Uh, again, you know, that was beca all because of bin Laden. And bin Laden, certainly in the early days, had a very strong cult of personality in the organization. People joined the organization because of him, because of what he stood for and who he was. Uh, he still has somewhat of a reputation for being able to recruit people, but it's very different now. Uh, but there's still that kind of um, deity-like kind of... Um, reverence to him that members of al-Qaeda still suggest is relevant to them today. So 1988, uh, they start up in Saudi Arabia because of bin Laden. Pressure from the West, in particular the United States government, leads Saudi Arabia to kick out um, al-Qaeda and bin Laden mostly and, and the band of three. And they move to the Sudan. That happens in 1992. More pressure from the West and the U.S. Uh, they relocate in 1996 to Afghanistan. And that's where they kind of permanently make their home. Now, this is interesting, because if you know anything about Afghanistan, this is the home of the Taliban, right? The Taliban is a stationary bandit. So when a roving bandit goes to a place where a stationary bandit already has some authority, there has to be some negotiating, right? That wasn't easy. Uh, and, you know, they want different things, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. But 
They brokered some early relationships. That relationship has now been dissolved. Al-Qaeda and the Taliban are kind of separate entities. And this is where they position themselves and, and live out the rest of their kind of early life. Now, what's really important about this, the title of the talk is The Political Economy of Terrorism, which is kind of what we're doing now, right? And, and I'm using CIA language here. What's the countermeasure, right? So the terrorist does something, you have a countermeasure. What's the countermeasure? Broadly defined, the countermeasure is economic freedom. That's what I'm suggesting to you. And I think it's really important to think about the very specific places that Al-Qaeda decided to move, right? They're not setting up shop in New York City. Why? Because it's hard to be a terrorist like Al-Qaeda in New York City, and that's a good thing. You're, you might get some attention, you might get some donors, you might get some rogue people joining, right? But you're not gonna be very successful there. You wanna go to a place with dysfunctional institutions, a total lack of economic freedom, the absence of market economies that are successful, no rule of law. These are the places that are perfect places for bandits to go and set up shop, right? And even maybe get a friendly reception from the people that live in those broken institutional environments. So actually the lack of economic freedom is, is the place that they wanna go. And so economic freedom can be one of our most important assets against the long-term pushback against terrorism. Again, for me, it's about pushing back that demand curve. People have to voluntarily opt out of terrorism. We cannot force them out. We can use a lot of guns and we can shoot people and you know, maybe we should do that sometimes. But we can't shoot all the terrorists. We don't know who they are. And if you do that, more terrorists are gonna come up. You have to address the root cause, not just the symptoms, okay? So it's a much harder project than it sounds. So this is the early years. I won't go over all this, but what I wanna show you, remember conscious and purposeful behavior, Al-Qaeda's at work very early. Small organization, 1992, Yemen hotel bombings. 93, First World Trade Center attack. They're practicing, they're honing their skills. Why? Because when they get ready for the big game, often terrorists call their attacks weddings, to throw off CIA analysts. When they're getting ready for the big one, they have to be ready. They have to have practiced it, right? You don't go into a sporting event, into a military exercise without practice. Neither do they. This is the marked behavior of people who are very cautious about what they're doing. That's important to keep in mind. Embassy bombings in Kenya, in Tanzania, um, 2000 planned but failed attack on a U.S. carrier, then the USS Cole bombing, an assassination in 2001, and then we get 9-11. Four commercial U.S. airlines are attacked, the Pentagon, Twin Towers in New York City, and a diverted attack which results in a crash in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Almost 3,000 people were killed, 6,000 people were injured. New York City was devastated in many ways. We had to rebuild buildings and roads. People lost their lives. We dedicated a lot of resources just to overcoming that, didn't we? Very successful operation from the terrorist point of view. This is Khalik Sheikh Mohammed. He's been in US custody for a long time, uh, since the early 2000s, and he claims to be the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks. He was in the middle leadership of Al-Qaeda, so he wasn't the kind of trifecta that started the organization. He wasn't top leadership. He was middle leadership. He was like a COO. And he designed, this is the Al-Qaeda flag, he designed the attacks. Now, how am I getting all this information, by the way? I'm a, I'm a young graduate student. 9-11 has just happened. Um, it's very hard to do. So what I used was the 9-11 Commission Report, which I'm grateful had been declassified at the time. It's available free online if you're interested in any of this stuff. There's, it's a very rich document about how these guys behave. And here, I think, is what's uh, really telling about how Al-Qaeda was planning to be as succinct and precise as possible, they were profit maximizers, right? They wanted the biggest benefit for the least amount of cost that they could possibly get. When you read the 9-11 Commission Report, you, real, you read some very striking things. They were trying to optimize results. Here's two examples of that. One, originally, according to, and these are all the how do we get this information, detainee reports. So Khalik Sheikh Mohammed has been um, in Gitmo for you know 15 years and we've interviewed him time and time and time and time and time again. 
over and over and over. His story is pretty consistent, but he's very proud of what he did. So, you know, um, there might be shades of, of gray in there in terms of the truth. But here's what he claims. The original 9-11 attacks were meant to be bi-global. And what I mean by that is uh, the desire was to have the planned attacks that did actually take place in New York, uh, the intended uh, target of the White House, but also to launch simultaneous attacks on Japan. And I want you to think about that, kind of think about the global, the domestic and the global reaction that we are living out as a result of what did happen. Imagine if they had successfully attacked the east, Co you know, the east part of the world, the western part of the world at the same time. Can you imagine the global fear and panic that would have ensued? They would have been very successful in their own eyes and they canceled that part of the trip. So they were planning and training for a very long time and according to KSM in his meetings with the top three, they decided it was too risky. It was too risky because think about the planes are in midair, right? You have planes that have launched and, and attacked New York City. Now you have planes that are headed for the White House. The minute the planes attack the Twin Towers, all sorts of security starts to take place. Kind of the untold stories, by the way, of 9-11, one of my favorite ones, is there's, you have to think, I think there's, if my numbers are correct, there's 23,000 flights a day. There's a lot of airplanes in the sky. They're not all in the sky at the same time, right? But there's a lot of airplanes in the sky. So you have to think, all the domestic flights that are in air, and we have the Twin Towers hit. Now we have airplanes that can't land. So these airplanes are diverted, a lot of them to Canada, that were over US airspace. Uh, there's a great heartwarming story about planes, hundreds of planes that had to land in this very small airport in some Canadian town, I don't remember the name. And there was not enough food, there's not enough hotels, there's not enough, so people, Canadians, are baking casseroles and stuff and bringing it, and people are just waiting on the plane until they can go back home. We don't think about those parts of the story, right? But the terrorists were thinking, maybe not about the casseroles, but they understood that the minute the first attack was hit, the tower was hit, all sorts of defensive me mechanisms are going to come into place to shoot down other flights. So you can't waste, you can't risk that Japan flight being intercepted. Because it's better to be a smaller scale terrorist that does a good job than to have a bigger attack that fails. Because a failed terrorist is somebody we're not afraid of. Terrorists want to instill fear and they want to not get caught. So if you do something that's too much, too big, too risky, spreads your organization too thin, what's going to happen? You're going to get caught, you're going to get put in prison, you're going to get killed. It's bad for the terrorists. So see, they're cunning, they're calculating. The other aspect I thought was very important when I read this book was this. The, the most kind of impressive thing in economics, we might call it a principal agent problem, uh, is that you know, the leadership had these big ideas. And if you read the publications or the speeches of bin Laden, it's about hating the West. It's about hating Western support for Israel. It's about restoring a caliphate. It's all this stuff, right? Big lofty goals. And when you think about, you know, what, what do the ordinary people want, I think that's an important thing to calculate. These three were never going to run themselves into an airplane. Bin Laden had no intention of ever doing that. Azam was never going to give his life that way, ever. But they're asking other people to do it. So they have to train these people and they have to invest in them in a way that they're very committed to the mission. And here's the problem. Once you send these hijackers to the United States, there's lots of flight risks. And you know what that 9-11 commission report tells us is that they were told to blend in, which is reasonable. Get a job, get a gym membership, it said. Have a beer after work, right? Like what more normal Americans do. Get a girlfriend maybe, live the dream. But don't live the dream too much, don't like the dream because we don't want you to defect. So they were very cautious about how long these hijackers needed to be in the United States. They wanted them to be there for the minimum amount of time to get the job done, but not long enough that they would like living in Florida and going to the gym after work. And there's a real flight risk with that, right? Why? Because economic freedom is amazing. It means you get to choose to go to the gym or choose to sit on your couch. Living in a place like Saudi Arabia or Sudan or modern Syria or Yemen, these are the hot spots for terrorism. Those aren't the choices of ordinary people. 
right? So reading that book really drove home this cost-benefit analysis and the way that we have to change incentives and the way that the leaders of the terrorist organization were working very hard to make sure their recruits were very committed over the long haul. So there's this, of course, you know, the reason that my professor wanted to, me to write this paper with him is he said, look, there's going to be a lot of policy that comes out the second, you know, 9-12. And it's going to be bad policy. He's an economist. Why would he say that? Because he understood that it was not going to be thoughtful. It was not going to weigh costs and benefits. It was not going to think about the long run. It was not going to consider unintended consequences. But it was rather going to be quick, sloppy, but to made to make us feel safe. And you know what? I mean, I would never want to be George Bush on that day. So it's very easy for me to critique his comments. But I do it with a lot of humility, OK? But the point here is that this is what is unleashed policy-wise after 9-11. This is what Bush says. This is shortly after 9-11, and he's at ground zero. OK? He says oh, so the 20th of September. Uh, Bush stated that our war on terror, this is the first time this phrase is used publicly by a president. Okay, he launches this. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. And I think, whoa, that's a tall order. Because here's the thing, terrorism is not new. Humans have been terrorizing each other as long as humans have been around. What Al-Qaeda was doing was an innovation, if you will, on a way to execute an attack. But there's nothing new about human beings killing each other. That's a sad part of our history, right? A sad part of our story. So to say this, and I, you know, let's give them a little bit of a break. You have to say this on September 20th, 2001, right? The voters are going to ex accept nothing less because they want to feel safe. They're terrified. I was supposed to go to a conference as a young graduate student. I was so excited to go to this Liberty Fund conference. It was canceled and never, never rescheduled. Life stopped for people because we were afraid to get on planes. We were afraid to get on airplanes. So the president has to say this, but it unleashes a war with a blank check. And that's concerning because, why, why maybe? Because resources are limited. And the money that we dedicate to things like this has alternative uses. And so we cannot, as good stewards of our scarce resources, just throw money at this because it makes people feel good. So now we're living almost two decades after this, and where are we? I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, let me finish with some interesting aspects here of Al Qaeda. One of the things I really wanted to talk about and think about when I was at the CIA was, how do I distinguish different members of the organization? Uh, and what I suggested to my department head when I was there was that, you know, I think the suicide bombers are the focus of everyone's attention, but we can understand that, right? People will give their life for a cause they're very committed to. Um, we see this with martyrs. We see this with military activities. I, we can understand that. What I was really interested in are the donors. Who were the donors to terrorism? I, as I've said before, some of it was bin Laden's personal fortune. But this is something, it's a, it's a letter written in Arabic or a list. It's seized in a raid um, shortly after 9-11. It's called the Golden Chain, and it's a list of all the big donors to Al-Qaeda. I want to tell you two things that are very interesting. The 9-11 attacks were, um, cost about $500,000 for Al-Qaeda. That's nothing. And their annual budget at the time was about $30 million a year. So the cost of that attack relative to their overall budget is small. And the cost of the attack relative to lots of other things is small. So the bang for their buck is huge. And what was interesting in this raid is that we see the people that are listed on here, members of charities, businessmen, lawyers. OK? So there are people in the community, people with advanced education, doctors. These are not poor people. These are not people who are uneducated. Right? There's a whole variety of people who are there. And what was most interesting to me is who are the people that are willing to write, say, a $10,000 or a $1 million check to make sure Al-Qaeda can attack the West in various ways, but would never themselves get in an airplane and kill themselves. They'll write a check for it, but they'll never do it. Who are those people? What are they after? 
and how do we change their incentives? As it turns out, those are very difficult questions to answer, but I think they're the right questions because I think they get us to the demand curve of terrorism. There's something in economics that we talk about a lot and we say supply is demand in disguise. And what that really means is that in a market, supply is only present, right? The lattes, the blue jeans, the sneakers, all the stuff that we put in our Amazon carts, it's there because the entrepreneurs and the firms think we want it, so they make it available for us. If nobody ever puts it in their Amazon cart, it goes away, right? So the same principle applies here. The donors are part of the demanders. They're writing a check. They want the theater. They want the attacks. They want the rhetoric, but they don't actually want to execute. Cost is too high. To shift the demand for terrorism, we have to ratchet up the cost, right? People have to voluntarily opt out of demanding for that thing. Again, very hard thing to do, but I think the theory gets us there. I want to talk a little bit about, I could talk about this all day. Um, well, I keep stepping on something, sorry. Uh, what are the goals of Al-Qaeda? It's, it's kind of very hard to tell. I talked about this a little bit. You know, there's what they say and what they actually want. And I think unless you're interviewing them, you don't know a lot of what they want. Uh, but, you know, bin Laden said something like, well, I would like the U.S. to get out of Middle Eastern politics. I would like the U.S. to stop its support of Israel. I mean, that's one kind of very specific policy measure that you can understand. Restoring the caliphate, it's harder to understand. What does that mean? How do you do that? You're obviously going to be the leader of this. Do you want an empire? Do you want to rule a country? What do you want? Those are harder things to understand. And they, they use that as a platform to recruit. So the recruits are very different than the leadership. The recruits are the ones who are willing to run themselves into buildings. And we know for sure that the recruits were paid and that their families were paid. And that once they joined the organization, so you see I kind of skipped this graph, but this is called the hub and spoke model. So you have, it's a paramilitary organization. You have the leadership calling all the shots. They form these small, very specialized cells of recruits. These cells are, what, from what we know, no more than 10 or 11 people. You don't want a lot of people. You don't want them chatting right? You don't want them getting ideas. You need to radicalize them. You need them focused. And you need to control and monitor them. You can only do that when it's small. And the information flows in terms of directives from the top down. They don't have staff meetings and say, anybody have any new ideas? It doesn't happen. It's this is what we tell you to do. Go do it. And here's what you're going to get if you do a good job, right? Not only monetary benefits for you and your family, but spiritual benefits in the afterlife. This is Al-Qaeda today. So it's morphed from a paramilitary organization, very tightly controlled from top to bottom with a, a few leaders, to now it's kind of this franchise. So what we know is that there's a lot of terrorist groups out there today that call themselves Al-Qaeda affiliates, right? Um, and what that means is, is not much, as it turns out. It means that they want to be feared, they want to be respected, they want people to take them seriously, but what we know from the intelligence that we have on this is that it doesn't mean that they have any relationship with Al-Qaeda proper, with Zawahiri who's running Al-Qaeda. So there's kind of these splinter groups um, that exist today. I already showed you that graph. So I've told the story about who they are, how they did what they did, how they've changed. And I think a lot of it, they've changed because to some extent, the um, U.S.-led war on terror has raised some of the cost. And I would say that that's a necessary but not sufficient condition. The other thing I would say to this, which is what any economist would encourage everyone to think about, is what are the costs? What are the costs? I, I think the wrong policy question, by the way, is saying how do we get terrorism to go to zero? It's never been zero. It probably will never be zero. Zero is probably not the right number. So it's kind of very a cynical thing to say, right? There's, a, there's an optimal non-zero amount of terrorism. But what you want is for the terrorists to be dysfunctional, ineffective, talking heads, right? People who command YouTube stations but don't actually blow anything up. That's what you want. Or another thing that we can see sometimes is the terrorist group get kind of um, more moderate and transform into political parties in the areas that they are. 
right? So there's a lot of ways that this can go, but none of it's easy, and a lot of it has a high cost. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And the question is, it's a, the problem is this is a collective decision. We have to decide as a society, and that's a very hard thing to do. The overall war on terror, I just looked, there's a big um, center at Brown University that studies this, $5.6 trillion, and that includes costs to veterans over their lifespan. So it's not just the cost today, it's the full cost of the war on terror, right? 400,000 people dead since 2001. It's a lot of lives, it's a lot of money. I did a little research on some of this stuff. Oh, let me get to that in a second. So total deaths on the war on terror, 225. Um, sorry, not 400,000. Patriot Act and the USA Freedom Act, which is uh, reinvigorated in 2015. What does it allow the state to do? Again, the intentions are good, right? We want to make sure another 9-11 never happens because that's terrible. The intentions are good. But do, do, the, do the state policy actions get us there? So we have now roving wiretaps, searching business records, surveillance of people who we think are lone wolves, indefinite detention of immigrants, the expanding powers of law enforcement to detain people who are suspicious, searching your phone, your email, your financial records. How much of this is worth it? And that's one part of the question, because that's the cost side of the calculation, right? And is it getting us the desired outcome? That's just basic economics, right? Is the cost netting you the benefit? Now, we might say, well, Professor Bradley, we've spent all that money, there's a lot of casualties, we've had to give up some of our civil liberties, but there's never been another 9-11 on U.S. soil. This is true. But how much is that related to each other? And if you look at the, um, the graph that I showed you at the beginning, actually, 2014 was the historic world record for terrorist attacks. So it's not here but it's other places. Terrorism was not a problem in Nigeria in 2001. It's a hotbed for Boko Haram now. So terrorists are moving around in a very opportunistic way. We have not defeated terrorism globally. Maybe we're marginally safer here. I'm not sure, I'm not convinced of that. What is gonna make us safer? What is gonna make us freer? And more important, what is gonna deter the demand curve? One thing I have to add here too, this is kind of cynical economics, but it's important. Who are the beneficiaries of this? We've talked, I've talked a lot about the costs, right? Who are the beneficiaries? Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, and GD, General Dynamics. I did a little research on this. These are the top uh, most um, financially lucrative military contracts as it pertains to the war on terror. They're the most lucrative contracts. Lockheed Martin, $36.3 billion. So here's the thing that I, I'm not saying we can't ever do this. I'm not maybe saying we even, you know, it's not necessary. Maybe, I don't know. But here's the thing. This changes the incentives of large corporations who are involved in making things like planes, right? And this type of military technology. Boeing, Lockheed Martin benefit from us being in a perpetual state of war, regardless of whether that state of war is actually reducing terrorism. That should make your skin crawl as a human being, I think. They get richer because we're in a state of war. And if you add up all these numbers, it's $90 billion. That's more than the total GDP of Luxembourg, which, by the way, has the highest GDP per capita in the world. So those resources are scarce. They have opportunity costs and they could be used in more productive ways. So what am I saying to you? Do we just walk away and not do anything? No. But as an economist, what I'm saying is, who's benefiting from things the way they are now? How much do we give up as ordinary citizens? And are we really getting less terrorism? Globally, we are not. We have more terrorism, not less than 2001. So something's not working. And so what the economist says is, let's reassess. So I want to wrap up with, with what we do here. What is the reassessment? What can we do? And I would say to you that in some ways this is easy. We need more economic freedom. People aren't going to join terrorist groups if they live in a society where property rights are protected, entrepreneurship is flourishing, ordinary people can start businesses, go to college, marry who they want, so economic freedom tends to be tied with other types of freedoms that are very important. Civil society, civil freedoms, 
that tends to have a democratizing effect. So economic freedom lends itself to political freedom, right? And religious freedom is an important component of this. We can't change all that with one policy. But there are ways, and I think one of the most important ways is trade, that can allow us to create economic interdependencies, not with governments, but with citizens around the world that actually pave the path for more economic freedom in the future. Because here's what I'm worried about. This is, if we look at economic freedom, so as economists, that's something we measure with data, okay? These are the places uh, that, ha that are, uh, um, have the most active terrorist activity in the world today. Iraq, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Syria, Yemen, Pakistan. So just as a thought experiment, I went and looked up those countries up on the Economic Freedom of the World report. It's not surprising what the results are. Uh, Iraq ra ranks 124 out of, uh, you know, about 150. Pakistan, 147. Uh, these have no score because we can't even, they're even reliable data that we can use to measure them, right? So they're so dysfunctional. So this is an easy fix in some way, right? It's hard to implement, but it's easy to understand. But here's the thing that I think is disconcerting, and I live right outside of Washington, D.C., which is probably, you know, um, people talk about this stuff all the time there. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, uh, what I have to offer is very unsatisfying for a policymaker. Let's trade more with Yemen. That doesn't sound very sexy, does it, right? But actually, maybe it's the baby step towards transforming Yemen into a place where our fellow human beings who are born there and live there can have a chance to thrive, because that is what's going to change their demand curve. So in some ways, it's easy mentally to get there, and it's actually easy to have free trade policies. It's like the easiest policy to enact. Let's trade with you. OK, cool. Let's do it, right? It's not hard. We make it hard, but it's not, in theory, hard at all. If we don't do that, or if that's not at least part of the conversation, again, I'm not saying throw away everything. You can't do that. We're too entangled. We can't. You know, it's, I would like it, but we can't. Have you ever been to an arcade? I have a nine-year-old and a five-year-old, and they like to go ch to Chuck E. Cheese, which is basically like hell if you're a parent. Um, but we go there sometimes, and there's this game called Whack-A-Mole. That's not my son. That's hijacked from the internet. He's only nine. Whack-A-Mole is a stupid game. Here's why. You take, well, maybe it's not. It's like you need to get out some aggression. You can't hit people, so you hit the thing. But the mole or the duck or whatever it is, it pops up, and you whack it as hard as you can. And what happens? It rears its ugly head. Our foreign policy shouldn't be whack-a-mole. Because if we're only raising the cost, if we're only raising, um, pushing back the supply curve by raising the cost of entry into a port, entry into an air airport, making immigration more difficult. We can do those things. We're raising the cost, right? But we're not changing the demand. We have to change the demand. It's a heart condition, right? It's a desire. It's your preferences. What changes those conditions for people? I think it's economic freedom. So I'm going to stop there and take questions, comments, I'll take criticisms, whatever you got. Yes. Uh, so far as uh, liberalism is concerned with the uh, success of a country or in terrorist action, what would you uh, say to Weimar Germany, for instance, where they try to instill a sort of liberal democracy in their government, needless to say, a very messy one, mm -hmm. um, but then that resulted in people following someone like Hitler? Mm -hmm. um, this idea of a strong leader? Such a great question. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to answer it briefly, but I think there's a couple parts to it. One is we can't force people to be democratic, right? So liberal, when you say liberal, you mean small l liberal, right? Like classical liberal, right? These ideas of freedom and liberty and personal autonomy and human agency and all those things that are valuable. That's what we want in Afghanistan. Here's one thing I will say. I think it's wholly possible, fully realizable, that Afghanistan could be a free, thriving place with robust market exchange and, and political freedom. But I, you, you, you can't do this. with a, We don't have a policy magic wand in the US to make it so, right? So there's a couple things. I think these are what economists call emergent phenomenon, right? So, so democracies are sustainable only when they are a codification of the values people already hold. So that's the problem in Afghanistan, right? 
Uh, the problem in Afghanistan, for example, we've been there for a long time trying to help them be more democratic. It just The problem is it doesn't work that way. You can't teach someone to like democracy. They have to actually like it. Why? Because democracy requires self-restraint. It requires a love of property rights, which means I'm actually not going to take your purse when you go to the ladies' room. And, you know, I, I'm going to respect that that's yours and this is mine. Now, it's not foolproof. We don't all operate that way. But it's a personal commitment to those ideals. You cannot teach that. That has to be adopted and then lived out. And through that, you get the formation of civil society. So I would say the, the key is let's not pursue political freedom via democracy first. Let's pursue economic freedom first because that tends to bring about political freedom. So there's a real um, empirical relationship between those two. What we find is that economic freedom tends to, it's not a guarantee, but it's, it's the best chance you have. It's the fertile soil for democracy. So I think in sometimes in our foreign policy and even in countries on their own, they do it backwards. And so it's not sustainable. So think about living in Afghanistan, okay? I want you to think about that for a moment. It's one of the most oppressed places, one of the most poor, poorest places, and one of the most exploited places on the planet. And we're the good guys, right? So we're going to, and I'm not criticizing, it sounds that way, but I'm just summarizing. We're going to come help you learn about markets, learn about free trade, learn about democracy, learn about liberalism broadly, that stuff, right? You're a citizen of Afghanistan whose government has told you over and over again that these people that are coming to help are actually the enemy and part of the problem. You don't have free speech, access to the internet. It's not like you can do a Google search and figure it out on your own. So you're very limited in the way that you can understand things, right? So remember the human model, the human action model. You have to have a vision for a different outcome. The only reason that you're going to adopt a commitment to property rights is if you believe that by adopting that, you're going to get a better outcome. And in Afghanistan, the government is the biggest predator. So the, the, an external actor coming in and saying, let us help you learn to trust your government. It's like, what? Right? That's a tall, it's just a tall order. Again, I'm not trying to criticize the U.S. government categorically here, but I'm just trying to use economic theory to run against the reality of where we are and how we can change it. So that's kind of long-winded, but I think economic freedom first, then you have the best chance for stable democratic-style governments. Yeah. That's a good question. I think every country has stuff we want to trade for. Uh, most of these, you know, the poor countries, the predominant industry is agriculture, right? So I think there's always, there's always an option. But I think that we can, um, maybe we is the wrong word. I don't know that the U.S. can facilitate all of this. But I think a lot of local trade can, can be facilitated maybe first, right? So trade with your neighbors. Um, there's another topic for another day, but in Afghanistan, you know, they're the large world's producer of poppies, which translates into opium. <laughs> so, you know, there's kind of all sorts of policy implications about that. So, you know, that's maybe a different topic for a different day. I'm not sure how the war on drugs, I think that kind of hurts the situation, not helps it. But I think every country has people who have creative energies that can be unleashed if they're given an opportunity. And that's all trade's about. It's about finding that kernel and letting it grow. I, I don't think that there's any, tra any country on earth where there's nothing anybody else from any other country wants. I don't believe that anyway. Um, but I think you're right. It's slim pickings, right? It's not, and here's the other problem with my friend Ben Powell, who's at Texas Tech, has done a lot of work on sweatshops and things like this. Sweatshops have been known to be a really important product or a, a, an aspect of economic development. So the thing is, you have Bangladesh, right? And it's a very poor country. And then all of a sudden, international firms go and set up manufacturing plants there. And what does that do? It increases local people's productivity because it gives them opportunities that weren't there. I would say the thing that Yemen and Afghanistan need are that. But who's going to go there? Nike's not going to Afghanistan. There's real good reasons why they wouldn't, right? So I think, I think you can, a lot can bloom from a little. And I think once you figure out what that is, the little aspects of trade that would be beneficial, then I think you can get into these broader environments where industries grow and entrepreneurship grows. Yeah. So, I mean, um, this year, all of the prescription have been to play with Afghanistan, even if it was ruled by the Taliban, right? I mean, in the sense like, or even when you have a regime, 
where you're not sure what their true intentions are, and like if the state goes through the government anyway, it should be that you know, the, the regime takes the majority. I mean, that, that's a good reason why we don't trade with Iran, right? Because right. So I mean, it's not obvious that you know the, the uh, economic freedom of growth will yield the results that you want. I mean, it could certainly benefit the people in certain ways. Yeah. But then you know, terrorism is not carried out by the majority of the people. It's carried right. out by like a small number of highly motivated you know, people, and it's not clear that that would, you know, like, you know, so like if, if there's a reason to cut off funds to them, you know, maybe we should pursue that. Yeah, so I think you're right, um, or, or I think you could be right, but I, I still really stand committed to the idea of the long game is the game of economic freedom. How do you get there when you have a country where the government is controlling all trade. I think it's very hard, but I think we have to think outside of, you know, establishing a bilateral trade agreement between the US government, you know, and one of these governments. I think we need to think more about how do you cultivate local trade within the country to the extent that you can, because I think his point is the right one. Most people in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen are not terrorists. It's a small, highly motivated, select group of people. And in some cases, the government benefits from that and sponsors it. So you want to usurp the government. When I talk about trade, I mean it in the, the most market-friendly sense of that word, right? People to people, not government-aided or intercepted. So figuring out creative ways to do that, I think we can do that. But I think it's going to have to look... Um, in some ways like philanthropy looks, right? I think we have to be creative on the ground, figure out what's there that can be cultivated and how do you, how do you help, how do you assist? Because you need to build the, I still think that long story again is building the environment of economic freedom. Trade is a way to do that, but you're right. It's not just, you know, okay, let's have a trade agreement and we can go home and we've done our job. It's not that simple, I agree. Yeah. So I want to talk about your, um, the Osama bin Laden's educated, the doctors, the lawyers, the donors, yeah. um, a lot of the ones that do plenty of fine under the current economic system or whatever, yeah. you know, what really are their motivations? Um, when, you, when you're not hankering for a job, you're not looking really hard for an education. The leadership? The leadership, status, the leadership, the donors, just anyone who okay. kind of has superseded the, the system there, the ones that have benefited regardless yeah. of the way it is, why do they still turn to yeah, so I think there's a couple of different uh, examples in there. In terms of bin Laden or a leader, you know, founder of a group, I think bin Laden had a very um, explicit desire to get the United States to back out of Middle Eastern politics. And that's why I trace that story. You know, the U.S. has been involved in Middle Eastern politics for many, many years. I mean, it, this really starts post-World War II, where, World War II, where petroleum becomes an increasingly valuable commodity, right? And so that, that becomes now economic statecraft. We want to control that commodity. I think that we can trace that back to a lot of our problems. I think if the market controlled that commodity, it delegitimizes that political power battle, right, to some extent. But that's not the world we live in. So I think some of what he says is true. I think, you know, I, and by the way, this is a great question because I don't know, and I don't think you know unless you talk to someone and ask them, and we can't do that. Uh, but I was asked this in my dissertation defense. It was like the impossible question. My um, very elusive professor said, so what did bin Laden really want? And I thought, oh, this has got to be a trick question because I don't know. Right, so the thing is we can only assess what they say and then look at their actions and say, do their actions fall in line with what they say and are they effective? Um, I think the donors are a little bit different and they're very fascinating to me because I think terrorism is theater. I think it's they are benefiting from the spectacle. It's like watching a movie, right? It's like you pay for a $10 ticket and you go watch stuff get blown up. And then you go home and you're like, oh, the good guys got the bad guys. But it's just a movie, right? So I think there's some amount of, I'm just enjoying the consumption of this taking place. And so as a consumer of terrorism, I just want it to happen. And I might want it to happen against certain targets, but sometimes when I give this example, I say, you know, what Al Qaeda is doing is not, it's not like running a Chick-fil-A. It's not like you go up to the counter and you're like, I'll have a number seven. You know, and I'm not really trying to be funny. It's funny, but it's not that way. Donors write checks. It's more like the philanthropic world. A donor writes a check. They want you to carry out certain things. But, and so the donor can influence what the activities are of the group, but there's multiple donors. And so I think for the donor, I mean, why would a donor, why would you give to the Red Cross? 
Why would you give to the ASPCA? Why would you? Because you like what they do, right? And you want to see them succeed in doing it. I think it's the same mentality. So again, for them, I think what's really important is um, it's probably easier in a place like Yemen to come up with one extra suicide bomber. Uh, it's not as easy to come up with one extra $100 million check. So these guys are very interesting. And what we need to do is losing any donor because we're shifting their demand curve, I think can be a really crushing defeat. Because I think the terrorists ultimately mostly go away. They don't fully go away. But I think, you know, if nobody's giving any money to bin Laden, he's hopping around all over the place. At the end of his life, he's living in a cave. What's he doing? You know, you want them to be kind of like hot-headed cowboys that you're not really afraid of. They just talk a lot, right? So they get delegitimized because they don't have financial resources and they don't have an army of people you know, their minions ready to kind of levy these attacks. So I think part of it is the spectacle. I think part of it is just a pure consumption good. It's like going to a movie and feeling victorious that that happened because I also hate those guys in the West, even though I'm not going to do anything about it. I would never put my life on the line for it, right? Um, to me, that's where we've got to focus our thinking. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, uh a little bit uh, as far as the interests and the incentives of Boeing and Northrop Grumman and all that, but it, see, it seems like our uh, counterterrorism policy or the war on terror policy has been really uh, suboptimal, to put it mildly, in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, one obvious example is there, don't, there weren't any uh, strong connections drawn between Al Qaeda and Iraq, and yet we invaded Iraq. But, uh, uh, so I'm wondering, uh, when you look at the policymakers, the intelligence agencies, the politicians, and try to make sense, have they just bungled things, but they're sincerely trying? Or can you look at a, you know, use a, a rational choice model yeah. to sort of make sense of what's going on? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I try to do that in my own research. So I'm kind of really relying on the public choice framework here to help me understand this. Um, so, you know, Milton Friedman talked about the Iron Triangle, right? So you have this kind of place where when policy gets trapped between uh, politicians and special interest groups and bureaucrats, it's very hard to break out of that, right? Because it's very powerful incentives. So I think, I agree with a lot of what you said. I think this is far from optimal. I think it's extremely expensive. I think it has no end. I think, uh, I'm pretty sure Trump in, not this State of the Union, but the one last year, said something like, we're not going to talk about Afghanistan in calendar dates anymore. We're going to talk about it in milestones, which is just smoke and mirrors for I'm not committing to anything ever. Uh, and that's what politicians do. Um, so, you know, I think it is a story of the problem is, so from going from the titanium, or, or sorry, the Iron Triangle, I call it the titanium square, because I actually think what you have to, you have to add in there are voters. Voters have preferences and demands about this, bureaucrats, special interests, and politicians. And the problem is, inside that box, who decides? And the answer is, it depends, right? Um, I traveled here today, and I travel a lot, and I have to go deal with the TSA all the time. And I'm like getting a little bit, I'm a very optimistic person, but I'm getting a little cynical with them because, you know, um, I'm not sure what good it's doing, except making people who actually don't travel very much feel like it's very wonderful. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so protected. Isn't this great? I'm taking my shoes off. I don't know that that does anything. I think, but it's a big job creation program. So I'm just going to rail on them for a second. I think it's a very expensive re set of resources that employs a lot of people. And I think those people could be alternatively employed in much more productive ways that would make airports safer. So one of the, one of the policy implications that I've heard thrown around is that airports, oh, sorry, uh, air carriers should be the ones that are clearing airplanes. This makes sense, right? They're the ones flying the planes. So there's other ways to do it. And I, I'm not saying let's throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't need any security. But you want to change the incentives. The TSA has zero incentive to be good. In fact, not just being mean. Two years ago, there was an audit of the TSA. Did everybody hear about this? Um, this is like I follow this stuff all the time, right? 95% failure rate. How many students, if you have a 95% failure rate, do your professors want to talk to you? Like, come in here. We have a problem, right? Now, so they hired their own internal auditor with the same outcome, 95% failure rate. And what's happening? Nothing. It's like the world's biggest job creation program that actually adds no value. 
So that's where we are. And the, the thing is, those things are very hard to fix. I think the Boeing thing, I mean, I live in the western suburb, kind of like western suburbs of Washington, D.C. and Virginia. And this is, I live right by Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed. There's huge campuses there where lots of people make a lot of money and live in very big houses. And I think, okay. My brother-in-law, who's a very good guy, I love him, he's worked in the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA, which is kind of the military's version of the CIA for a long time, but he's been at FBI and CIA, and we were talking over Thanksgiving dinner, he, our in-laws asked us to go around the table and say what we're thankful for. And I'm like, okay. So my one brother-in-law says, I'm thankful that we're not, at, that we don't, we're not in war. And my other brother-in-law, who's in the military industrial complex, says, well, we are in war. And we've been in war for 20 years, right? And he says, and I'm grateful for the war because it put my kid through college. And I almost like fell off my chair. <laughs> because he's great. He has a job that's very secure. And he's, a, he's not evil. I like him, you know? <laughs> but the mentality is that it doesn't matter if it's wasteful. It provides me with a job and I'm just doing my, you know? So I think the incentive story, I think we can say a lot of this for a lot of the participants is good intentions. I don't think the people that sign up to work for the TSA are like, I hate other people. Let me figure out how to, I don't think that's true. But I think you get caught up in the system and because bureaus don't maximize profits, they maximize budgets, you have this kind of snowball rolling downhill. So I think that $5.6 trillion number is just gonna go up. That's what I'm worried about because it's expensive. And if it's not actually getting us the outcome that we want, then, you know, it's either another 9-11 here or somewhere else. Um, so, yeah, that's a long-winded answer, but I think there's a lot of very nuanced pieces at work there. Um, and they're very hard, once they get in that, you know, iron triangle, they're very hard to break out of, they're very hard to, uh, it's hard to undo those regulations because you have stakeholders. Yeah? Um, so, and you know, one, one other part of the story is that, like, so when you talked about, like, global terrorism, so, I mean, that's going to be much harder to prevent than terrorism in the United States. Correct. Right? So, for instance, like when the U.S. withdrew from Iraq um, and then ISIS took over parts of Iraq, then the U.S. had to like, get involved again. Yeah. Right? I mean, like if, if there was something we wanted to have control over, we had to get involved again. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I guess first we have to define what we really want. And then, I mean, I think like lots of the other people, honestly, like, if you, you, know, if you really like, if you showed them how much like is being spent, they would say well, we should just spend enough to keep ourselves safe yeah. and like you know not care about the rest of the world. But then again, that that's not going to look good in terms of like graphs on you know overall numbers of you know, if, if the US had not taken action against ISIS, no likelihood the numbers would have been much higher. So I mean it's it like you know we have to be clear that there are trade offs with you know with sort of every policy and uh, um, you know we have to just pick the ones that uh, we are ultimately prefer, but like you know knowing that there are trade-offs. Yeah, or pick none, you know, or pick um, a policy that allows us to slowly walk out of some of these things. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think Americans worry about their own safety first and foremost. I don't think, and this is not me being cynical, but I don't really think that most Americans lay their head on their pillow at night and when they're thinking about the war in Afghanistan, they're like, well, gosh, I wish my fellow human beings in Afghanistan had freedom. I, I hope we think that way, but I don't think, I think most people, are, you know, think about, I don't want to get on a plane and have it be hijacked. And that's reasonable, right? So I think we can't play on those sympathies. They're not powerful enough. But I do think that um, there's still a story of interdependence that can be told and about just walking back from some of these conflicts. Because the, thing, the story that you told is one which economists call a story of unintended consequences. So I think one easy fix would be to say, before we take another intervention, an action of intervention, the United States involved has some type of footprint, and I'm not talking embassies, I'm talking a military presence, peacekeeping presence, things like this, in 90 countries. It's very expensive, right? It's a very broad effort. So I think we can say before we do one other thing, because you're right, you know, the kind of the ISIS situation you pull out, then you create another situation that has unintended consequences. We need to bring that into our analysis, though before we take actions. And we don't do that, and the reason we don't do that is because policymakers have short time horizons. They don't have the same incentives, which is, again, why, uh, you know, from my own point of view, I think economists need to be brought into these conversations more to provide that insight. It's not whatever, you know, people don't necessarily think about that without being 
pushed in that direction. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Could you speak for a moment about what incentives would need to change uh, regarding terrorists who come from mater materially affluent areas? For instance, the London terrorist bombers, I think three of those guys yeah. were born and raised in London. Yeah. Boston Marathon bombers have been in the country for six or seven years. Yeah. What incentives do you think might need to change for, for those sorts of terrorists as much as they're not from no Broken, sources? right. So it's not an economic freedom story per se. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a good question that you raised because what we're seeing in Europe is a little bit of an uptick in some of these type of more isolated incidences, right? Which is the kind of more of the lone wolf activities. You have some groups of people being radicalized and people taking action on that. Uh, so I, I guess what I would have to say is um, we'd have to look at the trends in those activities. It's like you're saying, it's not financial, it's not financial reward. It might be um, being brought into a belief system that they feel very committed to. I mean, you know, that's certainly part of this literature is the radicalization and how much is that, uh, how much does that change their incentives? So if they're spiritually invested and they can be radicalized in an isolated way, but that doesn't tell a big story, right? That tells kind of isolated stories. So. I still, I guess it's an unsatisfying answer to your question, but I don't think we know unless we dive down into what are the profiles of the people who are engaging some of this behavior. Because even in, you know, early Al Qaeda, ISIS, the people that are orchestrating the attacks have money, education, even power in some, in some. so that's not the, you know, the incentive is the desire um, to have this altered world where the United States is not, you know, the international whatever, policemen or, you know, being involved in all these other places. So, but I think the good news, which is also maybe bad news, is what you want is if terrorism can't be zero, because I don't think it ever has been, I think we want to make it more lone wolf, people who are unconnected to large chains of resources, who don't have an army of recruits and a vision behind them, an organization behind them, that's what you want. I'm not saying it's good, right? I'm just saying it's a, a more optimal outcome. If you're never going to have zero terrorism, what you want is separated, isolated people who can't do a lot of damage. Um, you know, you're never, and, and then you have to have security and law and order and uh, protection of property rights, and you have to be able to you know, intercept and catch, it's, 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 it's just not a perfect answer because we want to believe we can get to the world where none of that ever happens. I don't think that's true. Was there another hand? Yeah. Would you think of uh, Donald Trump's decision to significantly uh, withdraw troops from uh, Syria and Afghanistan? Yeah, so, you know, I think he's feeling pressure. Um, and so I think it could have some good outcomes. I mean, my own view of this, kind of based on the story I've been telling, is that there's a lot of unintended consequences to having these involvements. And I also believe, as somebody who thinks about economic development, that military occupation and intervention is not the way you develop economies. And developing economies is essential in the long run. So I think it could be good, but it has to be done properly, right? According to the, you know, kind of this conversation we had a minute ago, we're already really entangled. So it's like being in a chess game. You know, there's already moves before you, and there's moves that people are going to take after you. We have to really be thoughtful about what the moves are going to be. So I think it could be a step in the right direction based on all the stuff I've talked about. I don't think it's reducing terrorism in those places. In fact, it's in, you know, terrorism has increased. I don't think it's going to get liberal democracies and economic freedom. Uh, and I think it's really expensive. And I think, you know, here's the other thing I'll say. I gave this talk at the Citadel uh, recently, and I said, you know, we need to be pro-U.S. military. We need to be supportive of the people who are taking these decisions to do things which may cost them their lives. And the best way we can do that is not put them in situations that have no real good outcome. Because people die over there for nothing, potentially. That needs to stop. So I think there's a moral argument we can make. I think there's an economic efficiency argument we can make. But I do think we have to be thoughtful about the way it's done and even about the, the way we say we're going to do it. Because here's the thing. It's not just about what happens on the ground there, and that is important. But voters are going to have an opinion, and Donald Trump is seeking re-election. Lockheed Martin's not going to like some of that, right? So it's about how the dance plays out. Um, and that's a hard thing to calculate, but we have to be thoughtful about it. So I think it could be good. Yeah. Yep. yep. Do you ever feel cynical about all of this, as in, like, about the way the region is going, about the future? Like, 
for example, what was it, the Arab Spring occurred in, what, four years ago or something, and it was supposed to change the region, mm -hmm. which, which was bring democracy and such, but it didn't, and the Arab victory came about. And then now you see it back again in Algeria, where the people doesn't get their dictator president, and you, the people are saying it's once again that democracy was following the East and whatnot. So do I ever get cynical about, like, this is never going to happen? Yeah. I'll have to say, studying terrorism by yourself in your apartment when you're a graduate student for four years can have an impact on you. Uh, and fortunately, I'm naturally an optimist. And I think the way that I view and understand and think about economics also makes me an optimist. So I'm going to lead with that. But yes, I think sometimes it looks very dire. I think there's been a lot of lives lost and a lot of money spent and a lot of a hail, a cascade of unintended consequences that uh, I think there's moral culpability for some of that stuff, right? But that, I, I think there's still real reasons to be optimistic. And here's, here's the one reason, uh, I'll say. Um, most of human history has been a story of exploitation, short lives, and poor lives. I mean, if you look at the real long trend, most people have been very poor. People have lived on between $100 and $400 a year until, you know, recently. So... We all started out from a state of, you know, there were some people who were either divinely appointed to rule over us or we were born into a certain family or clan, and that was it. And look at where we are now. I mean, there's, there's increasing economic freedom over the world. I think there's real hope for the future. I think we have to be, I don't think it's a guarantee. So I don't think it's a guarantee that a place like Yemen can be thriving. There's no guarantees. But it's fully possible. So I cling to that in my dark hours. Yeah. So what do you think, like right now in Algeria, aren't they protesting against the president? They're asking for more freedom and such. Do you think this time that the that it was really get correct as in compared to what, like Libya across the border or Syria or Egypt? So, and, and that kind of goes back to your Arab Spring question. I, here's, what, here's what I think is also part of the hope. I, I actually think that um, social media um, and access, increasing access to the internet, which is just explosive, uh, and access to cell phones, which is explosive. I actually think this is very empowering for people to share ideas, spread ideas, in a way that really wasn't possible 50 years ago. So I, I still think there, there's this possibility of broadening horizons of remember the human action model, having an altered vision for the state of the future. And I think some of these things that are actually be, have become very cheap and very accessible even for the world's poor, I think that's the hope. So I think it can be different. But again, I don't think that you can politically engineer f long term freedom. Long term freedom has to come because people's values, attitudes, beliefs change. And the only way we can get those to change is, you know, cosmopolitanism and cultural exchange. That's my signal, right? And that's yes. our time. Thank Please you. Join me in thanking